Thanks, Lucky, for reading for us. And uh, good morning. My name is Mike. I'm one of the pastors here. And if you're here for the first time, great to have you with us. Uh, today's a special day in that we got to have those uh, baptisms. But in many ways, we get on with the normal business of this church, which is uh, looking at God's word together, uh, praying for each other, and trying to live in light of what God says. So I'm going to uh, pray in light of Philippians chapter 1. Again, if it's your first time here, we're looking at a book of the Bible called Philippians. And we're up to uh, chapter 2 of that book uh, today. So let me pray in light of Philippians 1. And then uh, we'll have a look at what we just heard from God uh, that Lucky just read for us. Let me pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we pray that our love will keep on growing in knowledge and every kind of discernment so that we may approve the things that are superior and may be pure and blameless in the day of Christ. Help us, Father, this morning as we hear your word and as we hear about your son in particular, that we might be in awe of him and live to please you in all that we do. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to start by asking a question. Uh, How's your attitude? Bit of a confronting question. (laughs) Do do you have a good attitude? Uh, You know know how the the boss speaks well of of a work? It can be quite a, a compliment for someone to say, hey, they've got a good attitude. You know, think of the boss that says of their work, you know, they're great. They just get on with it. Uh, they don't make a fuss. They don't complain. They don't whinge. They don't take a two-hour lunch break. They don't go to the bathroom six million times a day because they go and play on their phone or Insta or YouTube or whatever it is. Uh, they just get on with stuff. They've got a really good attitude. It's nice to have someone uh, say that about you, right? You don't want to be the, the person that's known for having a bad attitude. And we all know the types that have a bad attitude attitude they're always grumbling Uh, they're they're never a team player they're always worried about themselves and no one else Uh, and the truth is all of us at some point in our life at least at one point in our life have had a a bad attitude Uh, I can guarantee that every single one of us in this room at one point have had some bad attitude uh, because all of us have been pubescent teenagers at one point in our lives and uh, if you're a parent with teenage kids you know right that the phrase comes out oh just the attitude so much attitude uh, it's, if, if you're a high school teacher, you get that five days a week, right? The attitude. Uh, my, my kids are becoming teenagers, and uh, we have a new phrase in our family, and that is, fix your attitude. Uh, we're saying it much too much in the lead household. But this is the question for us today. How's, how's your attitude at the moment? Is it good? Is it bad? Do you have the, the right kind of attitude when it comes to living as a Christian. And what about collectively as a church? Again, some people here might be visiting for our baptisms, but collectively as a church, what is our attitude like as a church of God in Leppington? Do we have the right attitude? Do we need to fix our attitude? You see, Paul, in this part of his letter to the Philippians, he wants us to think about what our attitude's like. He wants us to make sure that we're thinking right so that we have the right kind of Christian attitude. And so today, the passage is is a bit of a diagnostic for us. Uh, We're going to have to think throughout this passage as we hear what God says to us, well, how how are we going? Have we got the right kind of attitude? How do we know if we've got a good attitude or a bad attitude or if we need to fix it? Well, it depends. How how do we stack up to what God is saying to us in Philippians chapter 2? So keep that in mind as we go through this passage. Keep thinking, well, is that how I think? Is that my attitude? Is that how I behave? Is that how we behave as a church Uh, Or do we need to fix our attitude? All right, so we're going to jump straight in. And we have two main points for today. And we're up to point one now, our attitude and thinking as one. Uh, So if you've got your outline there, that might be helpful. And it's uh, it's important to just remember at this stage the context and what we've heard so far in this letter. So remember, Paul, he's in prison. So the Apostle Paul, he's the one writing this letter to people back in Philippi, to the Christians there. And he, he doesn't know if he'll see them again, right? He's very fond of them. He started that church. He loves them. And he's in prison. And he's not sure if he, he'll get to see them again. Uh, he hopes he will. We saw that last week. His hope is that he'll be able to be with them again. Uh, we know from history that he won't. Uh, we know that weeks, months from the time that he, read this, uh, he wrote this letter, that he'd be executed in, in Rome. Uh, and so uh, he, we know that he won't see them. But regardless, Paul made the point last week that whether he gets to see them or not, there's one thing he wants them to do. Uh, And it's worth just looking at that again from last week. Look at verse 27 from chapter 1. Just remember this from last week. 
So Philippians chapter 1, verse 27 from last week, Paul says, he says, just one thing, whether I get to see you Philippians again or not, just one thing, live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And if you missed that sermon from James last week, make sure you go online and catch up. But that's what Paul wants in the Philippians above all else. So he's in prison. He doesn't care if he dies. He doesn't care if he rots. What he cares about above all else is that he'll hear from the Philippians that they're living worthy of the gospel of Jesus. And so Paul starts off the next part of his letter in this way. Look at the beginning of chapter 2 now. Chapter 2, verse 1. So Paul writes, verse 1, he says to the Philippians, If then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, if any affection and mercy fulfill my joy by thinking the same way. Uh, in other words, Paul is saying to the Philippians, if you truly love Jesus, you Philippians, which, which you do, and, and if the Holy Spirit truly dwells in you, which he does, then make my joy complete by thinking that same way. By, by together, as a church of God in Philippi, living worthy of the gospel of Jesus. Uh, really, Paul wants, uh, in sending his letter to the Philippians, he wants them to write a letter back to him, basically saying, our dear brother Paul, we want you to know that we as a church of God in Philippi are united together. And we're living together worthy of Jesus. And verse 2, look at verse 2. That we as a church in Philippi, that we have the same love and, and share the same feelings and have the one goal. That's what Paul wants to hear. Regardless if he gets out of prison or not, his joy would be complete if he hears that's how they're going. He would rejoice. And really, it's that picture we saw from last week. If you look up on the screens, hopefully you remember that from last week, of that kind of battle formation and the idea of, of one group of people together, united in one cause, with one purpose. That's what Paul wants to see in the Philippians. Uh, and if you know anything of the history of movements in our world, be it the, uh, the human rights movement or the feminist movement or the, the Black Panther movement of the 60s, the animal rights movement, even the gay rights movement, if you know anything about those movements, for all the good and bad of those, those movements, what was necessary was a group together thinking as one, united in one purpose. That, that was the key to any of those movements. And actually, if you know anything of those movements, they broke down when some of the people within the group went in different directions, when they stopped thinking the, st the same, when they stopped being united, that's when those things came to an end. Uh, partly because of things like verse 3. Have a look at verse 3. That instead of the, the group being united, there was rivalry amongst the group. Or, or there was conceit. So, you know, some thought of themselves too highly above the rest, and so the whole thing broke down. And so Paul, he's writing to the Philippians, and he's saying to them, don't be like that. Don't have rivalry. Don't be conceited amongst yourselves. No, no, you, you belong to Jesus. You as the church of God in Philippi, you, you share in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Your attitude as the church of God in Philippi is to be one, to be, to be together, united, living worthy of the gospel of Jesus, worthy of who he is as your saviour. Which at this point must raise the question for us as the church of God in Leppington, uh, and again, if you're visiting, great that you're here with us. But particularly for those who've uh, made this church their church, it raises the question, well, what are we like? And I want you to think about that. You know, what, what is our attitude as a church? Just think about it. Do, do we think as, as one? Would you say, hey, yeah, we're united. We're together as one. Uh, what's our attitude? Do, do we seek together to live lives worthy of the gospel of Jesus? I must admit, uh, when I saw that battle formation image last week, uh, let's put it up on the screen again. When, when I saw that picture last week, uh, I thought it was one of those magic eye things. You know those magic eye things where like if you, you know, squint your eyes and tilt your head a certain direction and stick your tongue out sort of a particular way, there's like this image that kind of then reveals itself from the middle. Uh, I thought it was one of those. I thought, hey, James, you're very clever. You've kind of made this really cool image. And if you look at it carefully, you'll see the Hope Church logo coming out of the middle of it. And you'll see that we're together contending for the faith of the gospel. Uh, if you were sitting next to me last week and I was kind of moving my head in weird angles, that's why. But you see, imagine if, if that was that kind of magic eye image. 
And as you look at these group of people united together in one purpose and you look carefully, there comes Hope Church as this image coming out of that, that united front. The Church of God in Leppington, thinking as one, thinking as the, as the gospel, living out the gospel. If that was the image, would that kind of image truly portray us as a church? So let me ask, you know, this is, this is not my church, this is our church, you're part of this church. Is our attitude thinking together as one, living worthy of the gospel of Jesus? What do you think? I want you to think about it, because this, this is your church, like we're, we're in this together, so if you're not on, on board and I'm not on board, then we're not united, we're separate, we're, we're divisive, we're, we've got problems. What, what do you think? Do, do you think we, we have a good attitude as a church? Do you, do you think we need to fix our attitude? Imagine if Paul was sat in prison today. Would he write a letter to us and say, hey, the church of God in Leppington, you think is one. Fantastic. You, you live worthy of the gospel of Jesus. It's so evident because I can see it in your lives. I can see it in how you speak. I can see it in the way that you love each other. So what do you think? Because this is not my church. It's our church, united together. We're all participants of this church. What do you think? How do you think we'd stand up? What do you reckon? Here's what I think. I think it's too early to say. Uh, we're going to have some uh, group participation time now, so don't be shy. Everyone needs to be involved. Uh, everyone has to answer. Everyone has an answer to give, so don't leave me hanging. Uh, we're all friends. It's all good. Don't, you know, don't be embarrassed. But just, uh, well, again, we've got Baptism Sunday today. So just out of interest, put your hand up if you're here for the very first time today. Don't be shy. Come on. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Come on, yeah, a couple of people, good. Uh, very good. Uh, now, put those hands down. Put up your hand if you've joined church here in the last six months, so say from November to December. Nice and high, don't be shy. Come on, Evan, hi, you're a student minister. You should lead by example. There you go. Well done, very good. Good ahead, good number of hands, good. Uh, what about if you joined church here for the first time in 2023, last year? That's me. I I've been here just over a year. Yep, a couple more hands, very good. Uh, what about if you joined church here in 2022? So you've been here for a year or two. Hands up nice and high. Yep, bunch more people. Go for it. Don't be shy, Jenny. Don't be shy. Very good, very good. Yeah. Uh, what about if you've been here uh, more than five years? Put your hand up. More than five years. So a couple more hands there. Uh, this church is only seven years old. And you, you see those hands, and it's, it's quite a mix, right? It's quite a mix. Most of them have actually been here less than five years. You see, we are a baby church in many ways. We're still forming. Uh, we're still working out how we think as, as the church of God in Leppington. We're not, we're not a pubescent teenager yet, right? We, we haven't even existed long enough to have a bad attitude yet. You see, God's word says to us, as the church of God in Leppington, this is how we should think. This should be our attitude. Together, we are to contend for the faith of the gospel. Together, we are to live lives worthy of the gospel of Jesus. Not only on Sundays, but wherever it is you go during the week, in your families, in your workplace, school, uni, whatever it is. God is saying that as his church, we are to contend together for that one purpose of the gospel. That, that's what is worthy of our lives. You see, we have the opportunity to shape the thinking and attitude of this church. Again, it's only new. The attitude we adopt now, that we begin in this church now, from these sort of weeks and months and years going forward, it has the opportunity to set the trajectory of this church for the next 10 years, for the next 20 years. And, and you know, you can leave all kinds of useless legacies in your life, all sorts of useless legacies, all sorts of legacies that will perish with time, that are not e e eternal. But as this baby church of God in Leppington, we have the opportunity to set the course of this church in the cause of the gospel. Uh, my, my question to us in week one, when we started in Philippians, uh, was, is our desire as Christians partnership in the cause of the gospel? My question to us two weeks ago was, should we be a little bit more obsessed with the gospel, given how good it is? Uh, James's question to us last week was, what is the purpose of your life? What's, what's worthy of your life? Because there are many things to desire, but none are as important as the gospel. And there are many things to get obsessed with here on earth. Lots of things you can obsess your life with, but, but none are as deserving as Jesus. 
And there are many worthy things in this life. There are many good things, many worthy things in this life. But, but, but only Jesus is worthy of your life, isn't he? So here's my question for us today. Will we think like God asks us to think? Will we together, as the church of God in Leppington, have an attitude that says, well, what we want to do together is seek to live lives worthy of Jesus? Because he's worthy of that. He's worthy of our lives. He's worthy of our love. He's worthy of our proclamation of him to others. He's worthy of every knee bowing to him to worship him. Because he's worthy. Now, if that's my question for today. If your answer to that question is no, well, uh, either you're not yet a follower of Jesus, and if that's you, it's so good that you're here. Keep learning about Jesus. Come to the life course tomorrow night. Don't miss it. It'll be very important for you. Or if your answer is no and you call yourself a Christian, well then, I think it's, the answer is no, because you haven't understood the gospel yet. Not properly. And if that's you, I'd love to talk to you to, to help you understand the gospel. If your answer is yes, I want to live worthy of the gospel, I, I want to think right and have a good Christian attitude, which is what our, our baptizees out there just promised to do. They just promised to live lives worthy of the gospel of Jesus. Well, if your answer is yes, how do we do that? Well, Paul helps us in what we see next. Point two, our attitude and thinking as Christ. You see, the thing Paul calls for in the Philippians, the first thing he calls them uh, to do in light of thinking the same, is he calls them to humility. Have a look from verse 3. Look at what he says. Paul says, verse 3, make sure you're looking at it. Chapter 2, verse 3, he says, Do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility... Consider others as more important than yourselves. And uh, isn't humility a, a tricky thing to pin down if you start to think about it, right? Because it's, it's hard to work on your humility. Because what happens if you work really hard on your humility? What, what happens if you work really hard at being humble? And, uh, you know, you go, whoa, man, I'm, I'm absolutely nailing being humble, like, how good am I at my humility? How good am I at being humble? And people look at you and go, whoa, you're so humble. How did you get so humble? Oh, well, let me tell you. It's a bit of work, but I, let me tell you. The problem with humility is if you try to work on humility, you try to be more humble, what happens? You get proud. That, that's the problem with humility. That's the danger. You get proud. It's the humble brag you see on social media all the time, right? The person puts up the photo of the family. I'm so grateful for my loving family. How great are they? Isn't it so good? God is so kind. And really, it's just a picture of them in Tahiti at some sort of like nice bungalow because they just want the world to know how nice their holiday is. Or the person who puts up the, the post saying, you know, so thankful for my short run today. Wasn't the weather lovely? And then there's the track where it was like 42 kilometers. And, you know, that's just boasting. Uh, in a minute, Paul will, will, will help us with a picture of humility. But in a nutshell, to be humble is to make yourself low, to make yourself low so that you can make other people high. And notice, notice in verse 3 how it's, how it's spelt out there. Look at verse 3. It's not in humility consider others as important as yourself, which would be really hard to go, I consider that other person as important as me. But it doesn't say that. It says in humility consider others as as more important than yourself. That's a tall order. Bring yourself low and think of yourself less important. Bring yourself low to think of others more important than you. Not, not as important, not equal. More important is what it says. Verse 4, don't, don't think only of your own interests, but also of the interests of others. And so Paul, he's writing and saying to the Philippians, if your answer is yes, I want to live a life worthy of the gospel of Jesus. Yes, the, the church of God in Philippi, we want to think the same and have a good attitude. Well, Paul says, start with humility. And isn't that picture of humility the most beautiful picture? Just think about it, right? Imagine it. It's a really hard picture, but imagine it. Imagine a group of people, imagine us, imagine all of us, a group of people, where every single person within that group considered others more important than themselves. Just imagine that kind of picture. Isn't it good? Here's an experiment for us. Uh, do you think of me as more important than you? That's a bit presumptuous, isn't it? <laughs> 
You might be thinking, well, I don't mind Mike. Or maybe you think, I just like, I tolerate Mike. But, but no, I don't think of you as more important than me, idiot. <laughs> don't be silly. But you should. And I should think of you as more important than me. Which is tough, right? Well, think of the person sitting next to you right now. Do you consider the person sitting next to you as more important, not as important, as more important than yourself? If you're a husband sitting next to your wife, the answer is yes, right answer, good, don't get in trouble, it's obvious. What about the person sitting in front of you or behind you, two rows down from you? Do you think of them as more important than yourself? Because that's the picture here. That's the picture. How hard is that? Really hard. More important than me. How hard is that? But how utterly beautiful is that? If we all did that, imagine how good that would be. Imagine a group of people united together in one purpose, considering considering each other as more important than themselves. Imagine that. Well, that's God's picture for his church. That's God's picture for his people. It's beautiful. That's God's picture for Hope Church Lippington. It's good. Seemingly impossible. How could we possibly do it? How, How can we do that? Well, Paul says, look to Jesus. Let, let yourself be spurred on by Jesus. Look, look at the attitude of Jesus and see how that will transform your heart. Look from verse 5. Look at what Paul says. Really key words, such beautiful words. I can't do them justice. Read them again sometime today. Verse 5, from verse 5, Paul says, Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. What did he do instead? Verse 7, instead he emptied himself. By assuming the form of a slave. And so if you want a picture of humility, here is the ultimate picture. Jesus, the one who is God, right? He, he's God. It doesn't get any higher than God. He's in the form of God, all-powerful, all-knowing. And yet Jesus willingly becomes in the form of a slave. Right? He, he went from being as high as you can be, the form of God, to something far lower, the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men, of people. of of creatures that that he himself had created. He took on that form. And if that wasn't enough already, look from the middle of verse 7. Look how it continues. Verse 7, middle of verse 7. And when he, Jesus, had come as a man in his external form, verse 8, he then humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. And so you've got this picture of the one who's God so high, can't get possibly higher than God, who then takes on the form of a slave, and that's pretty low, and then he humbles himself even more to the point of of death. And not just any kind of death, right? Understand this. Not just the death of an old man with many years and a good life. Not the death of some brave man fighting in a war and, you know, a hero's death. Not at all. Look at the end of verse 8. Even to death, end of verse 8, even death on a cross, on, on a cross of crucifixion. And if you know anything about crucifixion in the Roman world, the the cross of crucifixion was reserved for those forsaken. That was reserved for the worst of criminals. Do do you want to get to rock bottom, low, 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 low? Well, then crucifixion on the cross, that's where you find it. And so in Jesus, we have this, this incredible picture of the one who's higher than any higher can be, God, who then willingly and obediently makes himself as low as low can be. Death, death on a cross, scum of the earth sort of low. And why would Jesus do that? Why would Jesus do such a thing? Have you ever thought about why did Jesus do that? Why would he do that? Because he thought of you and he thought of me as more important than himself. Just take that in. Jesus, glory of God, says, I'm going to put aside my glory and lower myself to a forsaken death of a Roman criminal on a cross, people spitting at me, mocking me constantly as I die, slow death. He did that because he considered you of such importance. I mean, just get your head around that. Do we understand that? That that Jesus is like that. See, I don't care what anyone says. There is no greater example of humility or of love or of servitude servitude than that picture of Jesus. Of Jesus being forsaken on that cross, willingly so for your sin, for my sin, 
so that we might no longer be the ones forsaken. See, how, how can we possibly ever consider others as more important than ourselves? Well, remember what Jesus did for you. And be spurred on by that. Be rebuked by that. Be encouraged by that. Again, I know some are visiting here for the baptism. I know some here might not yet be followers of Jesus. But our baptizees today, they, they weren't foolish in giving their lives to Jesus. It's not some sort of wishful thinking in, a, in some sort of sky daddy who's no God at all. No, today they've made promises to live with Jesus as their king because he's such a good king. He's the kind of king who looks not only to his own interests, like every other king, human king in the history of the world, their own interests in the end. No, Jesus is the kind of king that looked to the interests of others. So much so that he died for them. And I wish we had more time to unpack these verses, but look at uh, what God then does, uh, then does for Jesus from verse 9. Last part of our passage, verse 9. For this reason, in light of all that Jesus did, for this reason, God highly exalted Jesus. And gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And make sure you spend more time on those verses in your hope group. But again, do you know why our desire should be for the advance of the gospel and and why we should be that little bit more obsessed with the gospel and why we should live lives worthy of the gospel. Do you know why? We just grasp reality. We need to grasp who Jesus is. He's the king. He didn't stay dead on the cross. God exalted him. He's, he's the king. He, he's the one who has the name above every name and that one day everyone will bow to that name. Every knee, willingly or unwillingly, one day will bow to that name. Because he is king. All to the glory of God. That's the reality. So let me finish uh, where we started. How's our attitude? Do we have the right attitude? Do we need to fix our attitude? Like every week so far in Philippians, I really want us to think on these questions. What is your attitude? How, how is our attitude as the church of God that meets in Leppington? Jesus' attitude was to see you as so important that he died for you, even on a cross. Jesus' attitude was to do all things to the glory of God. And so Paul says to us, if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, if he is, think like that. Think the same. Have that same attitude. It's a very good attitude. It's a beautiful attitude. No one can argue against this picture. A group of people seeing the other as more important than themselves. People not being selfish, but being selfless. Not, not declining to serve one another, but to love one another. All to the glory of God, because he's worthy of it. So if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, that is how you should think. That is to be our attitude. And it is utterly beautiful. Well, let me pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for that utterly beautiful picture of your Son, of how he models humility to us, of how he thought of us so important that he would give up his glory and come and be the form of a slave and die to even the point of death on a cross. Father, we pray that we might be those who truly grasp that kind of humility, that therefore live lives worthy of the name of Jesus, knowing that every knee will bow to him. Help us, Father, to live in light of this truth, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen.